The scripture reading this morning is from Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one went in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have handed Jericho over to you, along with its kings and soldiers. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for six days, with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and all the people shall charge straight ahead. So Joshua, son of Nun, surrounded by the priests, and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and have seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns in front of the Ark of the Lord. And to the people he said, Go forward and march around the city. Have the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. As Joshua had commanded, the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord, went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant and the Lord following them. And the armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets. The rear guard came after the ark, while the trumpets blew constantly. To the people, Joshua gave this command, You shall not shout or let your voice be heard, nor shall you utter a word, until they day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So the ark of the Lord went around the city, circling it once, and then they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests, carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, passed on, blowing the trumpets continually. The armed men went before them, and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. On the second day, they marched around the city once, and then returned to the camp. They did this for six days. And on the seventh day, they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you this city. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a great variety we had today. We went from Pentecostal shake in the room to a gift of the Joyful Accord and the Chancel Choir. Thank you for that powerful rendition of of experiencing the power of Jesus in our lives. Just a reminder again, if you haven't got a card for the Breakthrough Prayer, we have a special card that will help you in specific things you can pray for. You can pick that up at the Welcome Center. Also, uh, uh, we uh, have books available. If you can't be a part of the Wesley Life Groups, we have two at 5.30 and two at 7 and one on Sunday mornings. We do have some extra books. Feel free to grab one and and read along with us uh, during this sermon series as we think about circling our prayers and and journeying together on this 40-day prayer journey. We also have about 80 to 90 people who have put a mark on the map out by the office Uh, saying that they're going to pray for their neighborhood. Uh, If you've not been able to do that yet and would like to, uh, we have some extra pins on the side. You just take, first the key is just trying to find out where you live on the map. And then once you find that, uh, put a pin in there so we know people who are praying uh, for all around our city and for the neighborhoods around us. You know, the weather's getting a little better, so uh, maybe we can, you can walk around. And while you're walking, pray for each home as you walk along and just pray that God would be blessing that family and and encouraging them uh, in their journey. So so let us pray. God, we gather as your people, challenged to listen to you, to listen to your instructions for our lives. We pray as we think about Joshua and the people of Israel and that period of time at Jericho, that you would give us a gift of insight and wisdom today. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, When we've gone on a lot of family vacations, our family has, and when 
I think our kids, Katie was 10, uh, Megan was 8, and John was 5 or 6. We went on a trip to Washington, D.C. Now, you know, in we're true South Dakota fashion. We don't fly, we drive, you know. And so we made that long trek. And I remember on one of our trips, our son finally said, you know, next time let's fly. But anyway, we, we did the fun thing and we had good family time. And on the trip to Washington, D.C., we had to stop at my, one of my places, which was uh, the Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. Now, you know, you got a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 5-year-old, and you say, hey, we're going to go see an old Civil War battlefield. And, you know, they were jumping for joy and were excited. Okay, no, they weren't. And, uh, and uh, so I said, well, let's do this. You know, give me, you know, I think Paula said, let's, let's, let's do two hours just to kind of make Dad happy here. So we, we, we kind of toured around, and I was kind of getting all excited about all the different spots and seeing where the battle took place. And I remember when we were at Little Round Top, there was an area there, and we were looking out, and, and I overheard a group of men from West Point. And, you know, it was kind of neat listening to them talk about the strategies of the battles. And, and uh, that always has intrigued me, you know, that three-day period there in Gettysburg. And, and, of course, then we did this little driving tour. And, of course, I'm telling them all, my kids were just enthralled to listen to me tell them about all of the things. And, and in fact, we have a family joke now that uh, when you, uh, you see a clump of trees, because, see, that on Pickett's charge, they were supposed to go to this clump of trees. So anytime they talk about a boring vacation moment, they say, remember that clump of trees Dad kept talking to us about, so... But the fascinating piece was the strategy for me. And as we read this particular story, and I mean, it's a story, I probably the first story I learned in Sunday school was uh, Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho. You know the song, Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho, 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 Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down, you know. So, I mean, that's a story that, that has lived with me. And it was good to read this story again in the midst of this 40 days of praying together and thinking about Joshua and the people of Israel as they are entering into the promised land. Now, you know, Joshua has got a pretty tough act to follow. He's following Moses. In fact, Joshua was Moses' second in command. He was his assistant. He was chosen by Moses early on and had been with Moses through all of the experiences, in fact, was Moses' right-hand man, in fact, his assistant, and in fact was the military leader of the people of Israel. Well, Moses was not allowed to come into the promised land, and so Joshua is designated as the next leader. You have to think for a moment, be in Joshua's shoes. Here he's following Moses, and as he's entering and telling the people that we are now going into the promised land, he's probably wondering how is he going to do this? You know, Moses was the one that was telling him everything that he should do or what God was saying to us. And so he was probably unsure about his leadership of leading the people into the promised land. The other thing is the people themselves. You know, how are we going to go on without Moses? I mean, Moses has been our leader for all these years. He gave us the Ten Commandments. He helped us part the Red Sea. He got us out of slavery. How is we going to follow this new guy, Joshua? In the midst of their wondering, Joshua in the first chapter of the book of Joshua is given a word by God. And the two words that God gives him over and over again in that first chapter is, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. And just before the passage that we read today, Joshua is alone praying when a person approaches him. And he asks, are you of God or are you an enemy? And he knows that it is of God. And God says to him and gives him instructions on how to lead the people. Now we have to kind of imagine, you know, as he's hearing this message from God that this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to take the city of Jericho. Now Joshua, this is what I want you to do. We're not going to get any swords. We're not going to get any special equipment. I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant that represents me, and I want you to walk around the city walls of Jericho one time every day for six days, and then on the seventh day, walk around seven times. Now, can you imagine the moment Joshua heard that, and it was like, you're asking me to do what? 
Okay, so he believes. And then he goes, and can you imagine when he says to the people, guess what, we're going to take the city of Jericho, and by the way, all we have to do is just walk around it once every morning. And then we're done. And then on the seventh day, we're going to walk around it seven times. Now, when we're walking around once, you can't say anything. Only the trumpets will blow, will blow. We don't speak a word. We don't do anything. We just walk around. Now, when Joshua gives the instruction to do that, what do you think was the people's reaction at that moment? Are you crazy? How is this going to tear down the walls of Jericho? How are we going to defeat our enemy as we move into this promised land? But Joshua heeds God's instruction. And so they go ahead and they circle and they circle the six days. And then on the seventh day, they circle seven times. Now, when we think about that story a little bit closer, uh, Jewish scholars say that it was really a, a pretty good military strategy. Now, Joshua is basically taking the strategy of first closing off the city so there was no food coming into to Jericho. The other strategy is a, a religious one in which they're carrying the ark of their God around the, the facility, around the walls, and so they're saying the people in Jericho are thinking, well, when are they going to attack us? When are they going to come? All they're doing is just marching around. They hear some horns going, and what does this all mean? And so there's, there's a sense of nervousness and a sense of un, the unknown inside the walls of Jericho as well. There was a sense that maybe the people in Jericho knew more about the power of Israel's God than they did themselves. In reality, and sometimes we struggle in our prayer life, we too think we have the strategy of prayer where if we just stop and do these kinds of certain things, if we just pray in this order, that, then God will hear us. And so often when we pray, we usually say, well, God, I'm praying to you to do it my way. If you just do it my way, God, then, then everything will be fine. In reality, this story reminds us of who is people of Israel's leader, who is Joshua's leader, and ultimately, who is our leader? Who is the one who really leads our lives, who guides us in our journeys of life and faith? So often, we think we take the responsibility to do that. And we kind of go through the motions of that. It's really easy when we have challenged ourselves for 40 days to pray that about day 10, about day 11, it starts to get a little root, kind of a routine. We almost have to look at it as renewing ourselves each day, much like Joshua renewed himself and the people of Israel in recognizing this covenant relationship with God. In entrusting to God, okay God, if you have asked us to walk around this building, we are going to do it. In like manner, God encourages us sometimes in our prayer life to respond to those little nudges. In our material, we were reading about a person who was on an airplane, and he had a sense of, you know, when you're sitting next to the person, sometimes you don't want to talk. And this young lady didn't want to talk, but the, the man felt that, that, that something was wrong, and so he, he kind of quietly tried to invite her into a conversation, and soon they began this conversation, and soon he was able to find out she was running away from home, and it kind of all poured out. And he listened to her and he talked to her about how he's experienced the power of God's love in his life. And he was able to then reunite her with her family. That all came from a gentle nudge because, you know, it's kind of crazy. I really shouldn't be talking to people I don't know. There are those moments in our lives, in our experiences, in our daily lives, when we get that gentle nudge and it seems kind of crazy. It seems like just walk around a a building seven times, and it will come tumbling down. I was, uh, on February 18th, our leaders of our church, we uh, shared in a, a preparation, a prayer event, uh, in preparation for our 40 days of Lent, and we had about 40 or 50 of our leaders in the sanctuary here, and we had a half-hour service. And part of the service was this particular scripture, and then we walked around the sanctuary seven times in a, in a prayer walk. Now, I have to admit, when we started this, I was thinking, 
these people are going to go, this pastor is crazy. We're going to walk around, you know, the sanctuary. And, and in fact, I talked to a few others who said, you know, you know, it's 707 steps around the, uh, the sanctuary. So if you need a place to walk and do your steps, you know. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it was after, I, I also got the feeling of what it must have felt like to be a, a person of Israel. We're just walking around these walls of this city. What's that going to do? And we walked and we prayed and we walked and we prayed. It became a very powerful moment of knowing that we were trusting, like the people of Israel and like Joshua, God's instructions for us. God's instructions for us. Instead of going our own path and choosing our own direction and praying our own prayers, we relinquish the leadership of our lives to God. Frederick Buechner tells a story about a little girl who learned how to play the piano, and she played it perfectly. She played it with great discipline. She had practiced and practiced, and she knew the song well. And when she played it at recitals, she did it great. She was perfect. However, he noticed that her heart wasn't in it. The music didn't have that, that power that he expected. And it reminded him that sometimes we go through the ritual of prayer in our lives, it gets a little stale. We kind of, again, do our own kind of praying, our own ways of praying, our own thinking of praying, and not really expecting God to speak to us or surprise us. In this 40 days of Lent, may we surrender our lives to God's leadership really paying attention to how God speaks to us, not only in our daily prayer life, but allowing God to lead us in our moments of every day. Opening ourselves to that unexpected moment when we might talk to that stranger, when we get a nudge from God to say something. It might be the best word they hear all day. The gift that Joshua and the people of Israel discovered that day was who their real leader was. Because it seemed impossible to take the city of Jericho. The walls seemed too big and too great. And yet, when they shouted at the end of that seventh time around, the walls came tumbling down. God is our leader. God is the one who leads us in our prayer life, in our daily life. If we offer ourselves to be open to God's presence every day. We are renewed again and renewed again every day when we get into that pattern of prayer, not looking at it as a, a thing to do, but putting our heart into it. And in doing so, putting our heart into it helps it to become fresh and new each day, and we expect to see God in our midst and surrounding us. Kathy was a, a great hiker. She loved to hike. She'd done a lot of hikes. She's hiked mountains, and this particular place was in Hawaii. Uh, it was about an 11-mile hike, and she could see, as she was told, it was a little dangerous, but she could see all of the, of the beauty of, of Hawaii, the waterfalls and, and cliffs and even the vegetation. And it, it turned out to be that way, and, and you know, being an experienced hiker, uh, she kind of got off the trail a little bit, but she figured she could find her way back, and pretty soon she got far enough off that she was completely lost, and she came upon a, 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 a cliff, a, a sheer cliff that was pretty high, and she thought, well, if I climb up it and I'll get over, I'll be able to find the trail again. <clears throat> well, she begins to climb up it and ends up on a, probably a two-foot ledge and figures out she can't go any higher and she can't get back down. She didn't know what to do. And so in that moment, she just stayed there because she had been taught that if you just stay in place, that there'll be people who will come and rescue you. And she had signed it up because this was kind of a national park area. And so indeed, she had to end up spending the night there. And the next day, the rescuers came and found her, but they couldn't rescue her. They had to get a helicopter. So they told her she had to stay another night on that ledge. And she said the moment was very powerful for her because she had realized that she had gone on her own. She had gotten herself lost. And she didn't know where to go or what to do. 
She said, I gave my life to Jesus when I was 11 years old, and I have always thought that God and Jesus would guide my path, but you know what? I discovered that I always try to go my own way, and look where it got me. She said that moment that night, she said, I wanted to renew my relationship with God so that I could have a passion and a freshness and a know God every day of my life so that I would truly surrender my life to him. It shouldn't take the walls of Jericho or standing on a ledge to recognize that God needs to be the one who leads our lives. It takes complete surrender of our hearts and our lives. And in the power of daily prayer, not to pray what we need or what we want, God listens to those, but also to listen to God's instructions for our lives. And those gentle nudges where we can make a difference in somebody else's life, even if it seems kind of crazy. It is our prayer that we will circle those prayers of of joy and need and direction and guidance and wisdom that only God can give to you and to me. May we circle those prayers each day and recognize it is God who leads us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this gift of Joshua and the people of Israel. That in the midst of their doubt, in the midst of encountering a wall that seemed impossible, that you demonstrated to them when they are faithful and they placed their trust in you, the walls come tumbling down. Lord, renew us and refresh us that in this 40 days of prayer it does not become drudgery or something that we have to do but something that we want to do. Help us to put our heart in it so that we may not only be transformed, but that we would allow you to lead our lives and lead our church. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.